Quiz time, YouTube. Have you ever had a residential LED bulb last as long as the box said it would? 15 times longer than incandescent. Not in my experience. My post light is incandescent, and due to a light dark sensor I installed all by myself, it's been on 24 hours a day for nine years straight and still works great. These big box store offshore turds crap out after five years or less, and I'm sick of pretending they're better. Before I go the hipster route and go back to inefficient incandescent bulbs, let's crack these open for a quick post-mortem. I'm not picking on any brand in particular. I've got these Fight Electrics from the place with the helpful hardware folks, Eco Smarts from Orange Store Bad, Utilitech Pros from Lowe's, and this Tem Jing from Amazon. All create beautiful light at impressive efficiency levels right into an early grave. I'm going to start with this Tem Jing low profile disc. You can put it in your ceiling fan. It's 20 bucks, comes with a two year warranty. It's rated for 30,000 hours or 3.4 years of constant duty. It lasted me 15 months of intermittent duty and the company no longer exists, at least not by that name. I'm starting with this because it's a great demonstration of how these LED bulbs are at least supposed to work. The components are all the same, but this surgery is minimally invasive and because it's jumbo, I don't need a magnifying glass to see the components. Got my trusty magnifying glass, let's take a look. 3225K. That's a varistor used for surge protection. I don't need to Google this one. See the plus and minus sign on one side and the sine waves on the other? It's a little bitty baby bridge rectifier for converting AC to DC. All the men in my family get glasses at age 40. I got seven more years of this crap. These are current control chips because left to their own devices, LEDs would pig out on electrons and burn themselves out. Normally there'd be one of these, and the reason this has three is because of this switch here. You can select 5000K if you're a psychopath, which powers this circuit of bright white LEDs, 3000K for normal humans, which powers these warmer LEDs, and 4000K, which I assume just does half of each or something. I'm a simple man, so I'm going to play this simple by going downstream from the source. 120 volts from the line cord. Check. God damn it. Never take electrical advice from a man with melted multimeter leads. I always get excited when I see F marked on a broken circuit board. F is for fuse, and I bet F1 here is blown. So we got line voltage in. Ah, and line voltage out. It's literally never that easy. From the fuse, it goes to this current limiting resist. Ah! Where'd everybody go? Once the picture comes back, I'm gonna try that again, this time with squinting. It appears we found a bad solder joint. Never seen a resistor like this. It's a quarter watt resistor meant for through hole soldering, but it's been surface mount soldered using this crimped metal end cap that soldered to the board. Because of course, if your board has an aluminum backing plate, you can't exactly through hole solder this. I don't like crimps that much. I'm gonna solder that end cap to the resistor. So there we have it. Cheap Connection did what Cheap Connection is going to do. This is sweet. Now I can put it back in my dining room fan. Feeding a toddler spaghetti by candlelight is, well, I doubt we need an analogy for that one. I'm sure you can imagine it. Next, I've got this EcoSmart bulb from Lowe's. It works, but that's not the camera auto exposure. It really is that dim. Let's put this in the bulb lens separator and see what's happening. Patent pending. Same basic circuit design on a much smaller, lower wattage board. Epoxy to this 
flimsy aluminum wafer for heat sinking. Same bitty baby wedge rectifier. Similar LED power control chip. They've used these push to connect through hole locking tabs to tie the board to power coming in from the socket. How does one remove this with any kind of grace or dignity? Quick, look over there. Nailed it. The backside has an electrolytic capacitor in parallel with the neutral and the current limiting resistor. That's going to reduce that flickering you might see on a cheap capacitorless LED Christmas light string. There's that current limiting resistor. You're going to see that in one form or another on all these LED bulbs. Better be right, or your great big venture. Red, red. I'm too old for this shit. Ten ohms. Again, going systematically here, we have full line voltage coming in from the wall. Full line voltage going into the bridge rectifier. And 108 volts DC coming out. But I'm also measuring about 50 volts AC from a device intended to convert AC into DC. With the scope hooked up to the input, we've got our expected beautiful sine wave. Wrong frame rate. There, not a big AV guy, but I think maybe you can't use frame rates that divide evenly into 60 hertz or something, I don't know. Now for the output of the bridge rectifier, should be DC. Ah, see how that's crossing zero? LEDs should never be exposed to alternating positive and negative like that. That's our problem. The eagle-eyed viewers among you will have spotted my mistake. DC. <laughs> oh, swap my leads. Strike two. There we go. Yeah, that's that's classic full wave bridge rectification. False alarm. Damn it. According to the data sheet, pin three and seven should give me the output voltage of this LED driver chip. Six point one. And if I measure the voltage drop across every LED in the series, it's pretty clear why they're so dim. Just to make sure the LEDs themselves aren't the problem, I'm going to see if I can drive them off my benchtop power supply. And with my third hand... That seems like a pretty normal brightness level. My gut says these LEDs should be dropping roughly 15 volts per LED, and yeah, we're not even close. With no smoking gun, I'm thinking the problem is with that no-name LED voltage driver chip. These surface mount resistors set the amount of regulation, and if one of those is bad, it could go haywire. This resistor drops the longer I measure it. That, plus its general proximity, tells me that this is just a bleed-down resistor for that capacitor. Three point six ohms, and nothing. If my meter is to be believed, this little resistor is cooked. I could try fixing it, or. Lastly, we have these Utilitech Pros. This thing is way heavier and older than the other ones. It definitely has some different tech in there. I put these in my basement ceiling when I remodeled it about seven years ago, and they all started dropping like flies recently.
Well, there's something. I mean, seven years isn't terrible, but it's not close to what they advertised. Holy smokes, an actual cast aluminum heatsink. I mean, I'm sure it's the cheapest grade of aluminum possible, made of recycled natty ice cans, but it's a lot more than the newer bulbs have. That's some damn fine adhesive there, Lou. I'm just going to break that circuit board. Just like a can opener. Any blood? No blood. We march onwards. Oh, there's a lot more going on in there. This is totally different. It has the same resistor on the hotline and the same capacitor, but we've got inductors and a transformer. Very interesting. Definitely a more old school design. I actually don't think this capacitor serves the same anti-flicker purposes as in the other bulbs. 120 in. I think this is a filter capacitor for a switch mode power supply. We got a bridge rectifier and a diode. And that combined with all these capacitors and inductors and that lonely switching transistor, if it looks like a duck and it sounds like a duck, it's probably a switch mode power supply. Let's see if we got anything at all on the outputs. Ah, oh, man. It looks like a duck and it sounds like a duck, but now it smells like my high school electronics class. Did I kill it? Oh, yeah. That resistor is smoked. It smells like nostalgia. I could replace that resistor, but I have a clinical lack of motivation, and I'm damn sure it wasn't the root cause here. Switch mode power supplies, they usually fail because a capacitor is getting old or diodes and transistors overheating. These little LEDs have a level of aluminum heat sinking that defies the purchase price of these disposable old bulbs. Disposable bulbs. As you can see, they work just fine. In lieu of actual circuit troubleshooting ability, I'm just going to strip off all the major components and check them all one by one, starting with that transistor. There are many safe and effective ways to desolder a component. Well, it's effective. This is a high voltage switching NPN transistor. Easy enough to check with a meter. With the positive lead on the base, I should have some resistance to the collector. I should have slightly more resistance from base to emitter, which I do. And if I switch the leads around, I should have an open circuit in the same pins. So this transistor is exonerated. All the capacitors have been stripped as well. Let's check them one by one. Good, 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 good. Shit, 
I'm all out. No cap. The last major component is this transformer. I'm just going to ohm out across the windings and make sure nothing's opened up. I can't read the number to find the data sheet, but it appears okay. So that just leaves two inductors, the resistors, which all ohmed out fine, that bridge rectifier, which measured okay, and the protection diode for the transistor, but the transistor measured okay, so I assume that means that the protection diode was also okay. Now that I've dickered the board so badly that I can't test this theory, I'm guessing this was the case of another bad solder joint, or loose connection. Which brings me to the question of why these boards all fail in the first place. And the answer, in my professional opinion, is a combination of mass scale value engineering and heat. An incandescent bulb has one working part. Look at the hoops you have to jump through to get an LED to work on residential AC power. Complexity is the enemy of reliability. Am I right, Scotty? Aye, sir. The more they overthink the plumbing, the easier it is to stop up the drain. And if all that plumbing is made out of bargain basement offshore electronic components, eh, it's only a matter of time. Yes, with proper heat sinking and power control, LEDs can last this long, but the circuitry to drive them won't, especially when it's subjected to the heat present at the base of an LED bulb. As I've demonstrated before, LEDs get pretty damn hot. Not a good environment for cheap electronics. But now that incandescent bulbs have been relegated to the hipster section of Home Depot, it looks like this is a future we're stuck with. Thanks for watching.